Good evening, I'm Mike Wise. There's help coming for more essential workers trying to balance childcare needs with showing up for work. People who work in grocery stores will soon be among those eligible for free daycare. But that move comes amid a COVID-19 outbreak at a Toronto daycare set up for existing essential workers. Lisa Shing has the latest. The Jesse Ketchum Child Care Centre in Toronto is quiet today, shut down for two weeks after four staff members and an eight-month-old tested positive for COVID-19. One other worker is waiting for results. This first incident in one of our emergency child care centres is a sad reminder of the dangers of COVID-19 and some of its continuing unknowns. The city is now investigating how it spread, and it's looking at ways to strengthen the rules around these centres. So far, that doesn't include masks. In mid-April, Toronto's Children's Services Division sent this memo to city-run daycares. It instructed staff not to wear non-surgical or homemade masks, citing no evidence they protect the user. It might offer a false sense of security, and children might be intrigued by or scared of them. We know that masks can prevent spread. We have provided uh, the best available advice ba based on the uh, uh, best available evidence. This outbreak comes as the province announced more frontline workers will be eligible for free childcare. That includes those in retail, grocery stores and pharmacies, retirement homes and truck drivers. Workers on the front lines are making a difference in this province. They ensure our shelves are stocked and our families are fed. As more parents put their children in these daycares, Lecce says they're doing everything they can to prevent more outbreaks, including testing all childcare workers and... No site could exceed 50 people. That These centres must be thoroughly cleaned every day before opening. That all staff must be screened before they enter the centre. The outbreak at Jesse Ketchum is the only one in the province at an emergency daycare. Two centers in Ottawa closed as a precaution after workers there got sick, but they've since tested negative for COVID-19. Lisa Shing, CBC News, Toronto. The death toll at long-term care homes in and around Toronto continues to climb. Five facilities are now reporting more than 30 deaths. Now that includes Altamont Care Community New Shepherd in the 401, which has seen 39 deaths. That's seven more since just yesterday. The Isabel and Arthur Meehan Manor near Young and Davisville is now at 32 deaths. That's 10 more than Monday. While the Orchard Villa home in Pickering is reporting the most deaths in the region with 49. Well, High Park will be shut down to the public tomorrow. It's the city's attempt to stop people from flocking there and violating social distancing rules as they try to check out the cherry blossom trees. Today, fencing also went up around the trees at Trinity Bellwoods Park. I can understand why they're doing it. it makes sense. It makes it tough for the little ones, but, um, but it's absolutely, uh, you know, it's w what we need to do for now. Sacrifices for now for, for a healthy community later. It's a good idea, I think. There's a lot of people here that come by in the evening, so it's definitely a good idea to, to have, like, some sort of security around here. It's good. You can still see the trees through the fencing, but there's no sitting under them this year. Bylaw enforcement officers will be patrolling to make sure physical distancing rules are followed. Now, with High Park being completely shut down, you won't be able to get anywhere near those trees. But there is always this. We want to show you Bloom Cam. This is a 24-hour live feed set up by the City of Toronto, showcasing at least one tree there in High Park with a light on at night. You can search for Bloom Cam. High Park on YouTube. And COVID-19 is also putting restrictions on how Ramadan is being celebrated by Muslims both here and around the world. This year, for the first time, many mosques are getting permission to bring back an old tradition, using loudspeakers to sound the call to prayer. Angelina King tells us how that simple act is helping to unite many communities when they must stay apart. It's a sound Saraya Ibrahim hasn't heard on the streets since her childhood in Ethiopia. Now she can hear the call to prayer outside every day at sunset for the rest of Ramadan. It's one of the things that after I left back home, that's one of the things, the call to prayer, that's what I miss. This is, will be very emotional for me. During Ramadan, Muslims fast from dawn until dusk and focus on self-improvement, prayer and charity. Traditionally, family and friends gather each evening to open the fast, then head to the mosque to pray. But this year, the pandemic is making that impossible. We don't have that connection because of the physical distancing. And I, I didn't know how I'm going to do it. And I, it was a very emotional time uh, for me. 
Ibrahim says putting the call to prayer on a loudspeaker will help. It's been coordinated with the city. The mosque says it's not only about letting people know when to pray, but about creating a sense of comfort during the pandemic and sharing the religion with others. All we, we, we want is just for people to give us a chance to, to see how we are, just to know how our religion is. Very peaceful, yeah. The imam says that the mosque is ensuring physical distancing rules are followed. So this doesn't mean that people are invited to come and congregate outside of the mosque. Instead, the call to prayer can unite them in a more symbolic way. It brings a sense of joy uh, and also a sense of assurance that, uh, you know, we're all connected. It's a sense of security that, you know what, that your prayers have been heard, right? Uh, and I feel like that's so powerful and can help people uh, better deal with the crisis. Other mosques like this one on the Danforth started doing this last week. Mississauga is also giving its mosques the green light to follow suit. This will continue at sunset until the end of Ramadan on May 23rd, a few minutes to help bring a sense of unity during a holy but difficult month. Angelina King, CBC News, Toronto. Well, Toronto police say they have seen a dramatic rise in stunt driving and speeding charges since the COVID-19 measures began. It's easy. You may feel, hey, the roads are a bit more open. The highways are freer and clearer. I'm going to get on the gas a bit. That, you know, you can do that. But know that as well. And you're seeing it in the numbers and the, in the enforcement stats that we're putting out that police are paying attention. Between mid-March and April this year, Toronto police have uh, stopped and charged over 200 drivers with stunt driving. Now that includes this incident at Young and Dundas Square where a 21-year-old man is now facing charges for doing donuts and then actually fleeing from police. The increase in stunt driving is up from the same time last year where Toronto police laid only 32 charges. Also up, speeding charges. Between March 23rd and April 27th, police gave out more than 6,900 tickets. That's 1,500 more than this time last year. The pandemic has also resulted in fewer people on the roads, resulting in a 75% drop in collisions being reported this year compared to last. Officers are reminding people that just because the roads are a bit more wide open doesn't mean there is more leeway for speeding or stunts. And the City of Toronto is taking steps to prevent the spread of COVID-19 in the shelter system. Mayor Tory announcing a new plan to move people living in tents into 125 furnished apartments. Lorenda Redekop has those details. Husband and wife Rob and Michelle King have been living in a tent downtown since last fall. They've been told they're on the list to be moved into an apartment on May 19th, an unexpected positive out of the pandemic. I'm excited. I mean, I don't want to be out here. I'm, you know, I've had my battles with my addiction and, you know, I'm on top of that now. But, you know, it, it's not easy to climb out of this hole once you're in it as you get older. He says he has other health issues and has had two heart attacks. He says with COVID-19, it's harder to get by or even find a public washroom. Until now, no one in tents was being considered for other housing. Many tent cities have popped up across the city. Today, this announcement. Starting today, city staff are helping people living in encampments to move into two buildings with a total of 125 apartments. Furnished apartments with other supports available for issues such as addictions and COVID-19 screening. Access to units will be prioritized for people in encampment sites that present health and safety concerns and are identified as higher risk to COVID-19 related harms. The mayor says the city will also resume clearing away tents from city property, something it stopped when the pandemic hit. The people staying outside this church near Young and Bloor are expecting to move later this week. I would say that our optimism is cautious. We had an announcement about hotel rooms weeks ago and there are still hundreds of people without adequate housing. The mayor also announced a plan to build 250 modular homes for supportive housing, the first ready in September. As for people in tents, he says the goal is to permanently house them, something Rob King also wants. I'm very excited about it and I just hope it turns into something long term, Lorenda. I don't I don't want to see this end and then we're back out here, right? Lorenda Radakop, CBC News, Toronto.
Well, the airport taxi industry is one of many that has been really hit hard by COVID-19. Drivers have lost a lot of business as fewer people are going to airports and traveling. But the industry is taking an even bigger hit. As Ali Chiasson tells us, it's also costing drivers their lives. In a time when health officials were primarily concerned about those who had been traveling to and from COVID-19 affected areas, airport taxi and limo drivers were still showing up to work. And their union says no one knew the danger until now. There are uh, at least four people who are passed away. Two are from limo side, two are from taxi side. They do that due to COVID-19. 50-year-old Kamal Dami was one of them. Aujla says many more are sick. And a few of them, they are hospitalized. Last three, four weeks, they are on a ventilator. Most of the drivers, they are not working right now. They don't feel as safe. The Greater Toronto Airports Authority acknowledged the risk to airport drivers, telling CBC News that they told license holders that as of March, they were not going to be required to provide continuous service, meaning, quote, their drivers are not required by the GTAA to pick up passengers at Toronto Pearson. And even though they do not employ these drivers, they still, quote, arrange for all taxis and limos to be disinfected before each trip at no cost to drivers, made available 6,000 disposable gloves for drivers, and posted signs in the driver cafeteria. Uh, our drivers... Ciro Vitolo is the general manager of Airline Limousine and is on the consultative committee on taxis and limos, which is a liaison between the companies and the airport authority. He's not placing blame. Drivers, when they come into this position as an operator, they're all independent contractors. The companies have responsibilities to make sure that the drivers have the necessary information. And you know, there's also responsibility on the CCTL and, and make sure that we try and get them the uh, proper PPEs. In middle of March, we couldn't find masks. We couldn't even get hand sanitizers. To protect the drivers, the, the GTA took an initiative to help with the cleaning of the vehicles. Out of 360 vehicles, just 10 to 15 are operating at the airport right now. And with drivers sick at home, passed away or in hospital, one thing is certain, Vitolo says. The, the collateral damage from this virus has uh, taken its toll on, our, on, our, on all our industry. Ali Chiasson, CBC News, Toronto. They're following their nose to wherever they have to go for food. Well, Toronto's rats are on the move. After the break, we'll tell you about the great rat migration from downtown streets to suburban homes. Plus. Well, still under the influence of the system bringing in the rain and some showers and strong winds, but it's finally going to be moving out as we head towards the weekend. I'm meteorologist Colette Kennedy. Stick around after the break. We'll have a look at what's happening in terms of this rainfall, but also at the sunny weekend forecast.
Time to check in with meteorologist Colette Kennedy. So we've got some rain to deal with in this forecast, but when we're through with that, man, things are looking great, Colette. Yeah, we are going to see a much nicer pattern, Mike, as we go towards the weekend. But it's this current pattern that, as I've been talking about this week, it's a little bit stubborn. And the reason why is what we're seeing with the jet stream. For one thing, it's almost this omega block situation. So a strong ridge of high pressure towards the east is sort of holding this trough in the jet stream here. And that's the instability in the area of low pressure having an impact on us and why it's really kind of taking its time to work its way through then high pressure back to the west and they're seeing some record warmth certainly in parts of the u.s but that's streaming northward too so as we go into friday morning finally this is starting to move through still some instability with us then but as we do get into the weekend we're finally going to say goodbye to that pattern and that opens things up quite nicely for us this morning you can see i want you to watch this progression of temperature so we were very mild through the overnight because of the cloud cover and the system in place. But as we went towards the lunch hour, watch how St. Catharines just soared up there towards 20, even at one point up to 21 degrees. That was because of a southeasterly breeze there in the Niagara region. For the rest of us, it's been the very strong east to northeasterly winds with some of those gusts which have been over 60 kilometers an hour. And even through the overnight tonight, we're going to keep some of those stronger wind gusts. Then tomorrow, they'll back off from west to east and we'll start to see things improving even in that sense. In terms of the rain, it's moving through in these bands, so this heavier one through the overnight towards tomorrow morning. And then we get into more of a situation into the afternoon of scattered showers, so not quite as significant in terms of the intensity. And with some sunny breaks, there could be areas where we actually start to see some uh, nice afternoon conditions as the day wears on. For Friday, things looking even better. So still a little bit of instability, but it becomes much more spotty in nature in terms of the showers that we will be seeing and that will be developing. So not everywhere is going to experience that. And then we get into this nice clearing as we go later Friday and into Saturday. So that set up for the weekend looking quite good. Overnight tonight, strong southerly winds into southwestern Ontario tomorrow. Those will be easing up, but temperatures still wet and temperatures in the mid-teens there. The GTA certainly mild, and in fact, some of these readings, we drop to about 10 degrees, but then rising towards morning up to about 12 degrees, even for Markham and for Toronto. And then tomorrow afternoon, not a big fluctuation, but where we can get some pockets of some sunshine and see this kicking out sooner is where the temperature will go up a little bit, and that's why even Hamilton, I have you up at 16, but 18 there in St. Catharines. For us, it's 14. Friday, it's 16, and things improving. And what a great way to start the weekend with sunshine and 18 degrees. Not a bad way to finish it either, Mike. 19 degrees. We will have a system moving in Sunday night into Monday, bringing some showers. But things really looking good Saturday and Sunday. Absolutely. Thanks a lot, Colette. You're welcome. The weather update is brought to you by Train, the most reliable heating and cooling brand. We test so it runs. Take advantage of special offers now. It's hard to stop a train. If you're noticing a lot more rats in your neighborhood these days, you can probably blame COVID-19. With so many downtown businesses shut down, the little critters are starting to migrate to the suburbs. Greg Ross explains. People who work in the pest control industry, like Dale Kurt, say they are suddenly finding rats in some of the most unlikely places. They're following their nose to wherever they have to go for food. And because the city has essentially locked down because of the COVID-19 pandemic, the food supply for rats has diminished in the downtown core. Businesses like restaurants and bars that would normally be putting out huge amounts of trash have closed. And now rats are creeping into the suburbs. What we're hearing most is surprise from people. People that say they've lived in a particular area for 20, 30, 40 years, and never ever having rats. And then all of a sudden, out of the blue, they have rats, their neighbors have rats. So they're looking for food, water, and shelter, just like uh, all of us. So when their food is uh, shut down, then they start to look elsewhere for it. We reached out to the city to see if there's been an increased number of rat complaints, but city staff told us they stopped keeping track on March 23rd after Mayor Tory declared a state of emergency. Since then, they've only been maintaining the most essential services. But pest control companies that we've reached out to tell us they're seeing more rat calls than ever before. We've had an increase of calls about 20 to about 25 percent. But the lockdown has helped in other areas. Because there's less social distancing, other numbers are going down, like bed bugs and cockroaches, where they'll spread between people. When it comes to dealing with rats, the experts say there are things people can do to protect their homes and businesses. 
try to prevent them. Don't keep available garbage uh, outside around your home. Um, keep the debris away, wood piles, things like that. Doing structural maintenance, you know, sealing holes, having proper door sweeps installed to prevent more from coming in. And they say it's better to do this before the problem starts because once you have a rat infestation, it's not easy to get rid of. Greg Ross, CBC News, Toronto. A group of medical students used some 3D printing know-how to get some much-needed personal protective equipment to some local hospitals. Really seeing this shortage in PPE really highlighted a huge gap in our healthcare system. And so us as medical students being taken out of the clinical setting wanted something to do, some way to help. And these grassroots initiatives at a time where there is a dire need um, are extremely important. The students are part of a team called 3D PPE. They are made up of more than 80 med student volunteers from right across Canada. Today they delivered 5,000 face shields that have been approved for use in a number of GTA hospitals. To date they've printed over 10,000 shields which have been delivered to nearly 20 facilities. Today the education minister thanked them for their efforts. This is the best of our province and we're proud of them and I'm proud to be here with you uh, and just to, to really embrace the spirit of our province that young people are making a difference. The group is still in need of volunteers and people with 3D printers. Well, if you need proof that doctors and scientists are the world's new rock stars, well, look no further than what a group at Western University is doing. Yes, of course, that's a new take on the Rolling Stones classic, Start Me Up. Lyrics meant to remind everyone what they have to do to stop the spread of the coronavirus. This was written and performed by a group of neurologists from Western University, from their separate homes, of course. They posted it to social media just yesterday, and it's already getting radio play across the country, including on CBC channels. <laughs> And as we head to break, take a look at this well-deserved celebration at Sinai Health. They're dancing because they've just got a COVID patient off a breathing tube. Wonderful team effort by all the healthcare professionals there that shared this video with us, hoping it will inspire people to keep doing what they can to stop the spread of COVID-19. Stay with us. We'll be right back. <laughs>
Even before the pandemic, doctors at St. Michael's Hospital say Joan Serum, an environmental services worker, went out of her way to give everyone a warm greeting and make them feel special. Three resident physicians in obstetrics and gynecology at the University of Toronto sent us a message about Serum. They say she, quote, would often make our days as she would always tell us how beautiful we looked, even though we had just worked a 14-hour overnight call shift, and that was blatantly untrue. Now, more than ever, we want to acknowledge the hard and important work of the environmental services staff at the hospitals. They are putting themselves in the face of COVID daily by cleaning potentially infected spaces to ensure they are safe for patients and staff. And of course, Joan continues to do this hard work with a smile and grace, even with the added fear that COVID-19 brings. Well, thank you for everything you're doing, Joan. If you'd like to share a story about your frontline hero, send us a selfie style video explaining why they are a hero to you. You can tag us on Twitter or Instagram at CBC Toronto. Send us a message on Facebook or email us at torontotips at cbc.ca. Well, when we are through with this pandemic, have you ever thought of the art or stories or movies that this experience might inspire? Well, tomorrow on The Current, Matt Galloway is looking how the Spanish flu pandemic of 1918 ended up inspiring and shaping an era of canonical fiction and poetry. You can hear that discussion after 10 a.m. on CBC Radio 1. I'll see you right here back at 11 p.m. on CBC Television. Good night.